Um, our next speaker is going to be Connor Burns from Cyclomedia. And Connor is our uh, a local uh, Cyclomedia rep out of Long Beach. And uh, again, he's going to be talking about street level imagery extraction and I think maybe some of the things we're doing here in LA County. Just a, a sneak peek, Steve. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we're good to go. Perfect. Well, thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> Just want to start off by thanking the LA County team here. I know it can be uh, pretty daunting to organize these these virtual events these days. We've done our fair share. So thank you, Steve, Christine, Mark, Nick, and anybody else I failed to mention. Appreciate the opportunity to speak today. And thanks for all the attendees tuning in. Uh, just a quick introduction of myself. Uh, Steve said, Connor Burns with Cyclomedia, just here local in Long Beach. Uh, most of my background's been in managing sales partnerships and accounts for data analytics software companies and now managing the Western territory for Cyclomedia today. So uh, topic for this afternoon, advancing remote capabilities, really want to focus on street level imagery and asset extraction, uh, and really tying that back to just improving productivity and workflows from your desktop, from your personal machine, uh, and really focus on some use cases there. So I've tried to keep the presentation a little bit more visual, um, no death by bullet point, hopefully. Um, so looking forward to Q&A at the end as well, and I will get right into it. So just to give us a sense of what we're all getting into today, uh, Cyclomedia, just a quick introduction of the company. I uh, really wanna show a sneak peek of, of our approach just to look behind the scenes on how we do what we do. Uh, use cases from the desktop, just pulling it back to really the subject of the presentation for the day. Uh, as Steve mentioned, we'll actually look at some East LA data work we've been doing with the Lariac team uh, from street level imagery to asset extraction, some pretty impressive uh, samples there. And if we have time, just an ROI, ROI example, tying some hard numbers back to some of the work that we do before getting into Q&A. So as, uh, as we go through that, just quick company overview, uh, Cyclomedia has been around for about 40 years, global corporation founded in the Netherlands, um, global leader really in ground level imagery and, and LIDAR. And what that means to us is we're constantly innovating, um, higher resolution cameras, new sensors to integrate, to bring uh, better data to our customers um, and new AI and, and automation to just scale the work that we do and, and support forward looking use cases. Uh, and all of that started from the stop and shoot um, kind of methodology that you know we may have seen in our history books. Uh, and at the end of the day, all of that work from the company and its technology is really focused on again scaling that work, uh, making things more efficient and that allows us to improve safety, improve scale. Uh, and with that comes the time and cost savings. So I think starting you know, the conversation with the challenges that, that many of our partners are facing, you know, counties and local governments, um, one that we're all kind of keenly aware of these days is just the need to improve and scale telework and desktop capabilities. Uh, we've all, I think, been forced to do a little bit more work from home, maybe a lot of it. Um, and being able to capture data, virtualize and, and digitize things is, is really important to that conversation when it comes to our partners um, in local government. And a lot of what I'll cover today is really focused on enhancing those capabilities. Uh, kind of paired with that is, is the idea of field work is, is time consuming and expensive. Uh, assessment and inspection of properties and, and assets is, is a daunting task at best. And, you know, especially in very developed areas such as LA County, it can be really difficult. You know, the idea of manually assessing and inventorying everything you want to in a calendar year. Uh, many cases, it's it's actually just impossible, and doing it ad hoc and you know can be inefficient uh, and just just rather expensive at times. So, it's so one other area that we'd like to address with our approach: um, imagery limitations, that natural evolution from satellite to aerial to, to street level. Uh, these all support different use cases. What I'll focus on today is really that street level imagery uh, and paired with that, the LIDAR and what we can do with it. Um, and the last piece that we'll touch on today is that current inventory is, is when it comes to assets is, is often insufficient. So whether it's not geolocated, uh, I don't have enough of that data to be usable in an operations management capacity, or many times, you know, we may only have 20%, 30% of uh, the assets documented, um, and that can be difficult from the management and, management and response perspective. So a couple ways we like to attack uh, those challenges, and you know, this was kind of me reflecting on what Cyclomedia does and boiling that down into really three categories. So the first, when we talk about imagery and LIDAR, uh, is virtualizing your environment. Um, so rich virtual representation of your jurisdiction, knowing where things are located on your local coordinate system in terms of that spatial accuracy and, and 
geometrical accuracy, uh, really important when it comes to us capturing data. Uh, once we virtualize that environment, how do we improve accessibility to that data? Uh, you know, the, the most obvious one is the shift to browser-based software. So our platform you're seeing behind uh, the screen there is, is Street Smart. Uh, it's a SaaS platform, so you can access that from any common browser. The second piece of that that I think is, is really unique to the way we operate is the concept of democratizing availability. Um, so when we talk about, you know, an enterprise engagement, um, it, it's not just, you know, an empty word. It's really, for us, everything is very open in terms of using I'm sorry, adding users, getting other departments within a county access to this data. Uh, there's no added hassle, you know, no additional fees. We don't charge by headcount. You know, our goal is to actually capture quality data and get that in the hands of as many people as possible. Um, and the last piece of that is very important to us, especially when we talk about asset extraction, is integrating with existing workflows. So you're seeing, you know, some of the common environments that you work in uh, day in and day out listed there. It's not all the integrations, but some. Uh, many of us know what it's like to go through a painful implementation, whether it's new software, new data. Um, we want to make sure that imagery and data is accessible in your common environments. And some of that actually boils down to also the way we will configure and design a geodatabase project when we go to extract data, deliver that as a complete geodatabase, the data structure, the relationships, the naming conventions, uh, all really important to make sure that we're supporting not only your current environment, but maybe where you want that environment or what you want that environment to look like in the near future. Uh, oftentimes will coincide a project, let's say, with implementing a new o OMS system, for example, uh, and make sure that we're collecting the data to support those capabilities. So to start digging into you know, our technology and, and how, the how we do things, uh, this is a quick look at our vehicles. Um, so that fancy machine at the top there does not capture ghosts. It's actually what we use to capture the imagery and the LIDAR. You're seeing a handful of technology integrated in there. And just as a you know, quick summary, I think we all know what GPS does. We have the IMU, the five cameras that are capturing that panoramic image simultaneously. The LiDAR scanner and the other elements like the operator tablet and the camera control are all, all really there to make sure that as we're collecting, uh, everything is, is of high quality. Um, and, and you'll see kind of a sneak peek or a, a look behind the scenes that LiDAR scanner is incredibly dense, you know, over 700,000 laser points going out a second to create that point cloud that's then developed into a 3D layer that is seamlessly meshed into the imagery. So before we dig into specific use cases and I show you what that process looks like uh, from the imagery to the LiDAR to how we extract data uh, in part through automation, uh, this is really just a quick summary of what we at Psychomedia you know, believe we deliver, whether it's the HD imagery, again, being able to inspect and assess properties and assets from your workstation, uh, delivering complete geodatabases of assets, uh, condition assessment of those features from the roadway, or even identifying you know, flood hazard and, and prone areas, first floor elevation of structures and properties that may be at risk. Uh, I'll show an example of that later on. And I know actually Carlos this morning had mentioned some, some work in that area as well. So this is one of my favorite images um, that we've ever produced. And it really speaks to something I just mentioned, which is the idea that we can actually mesh all of that high res imagery with that LiDAR data, that LiDAR point cloud, which is basically what you're seeing and create what this is, which is a colorized LiDAR point cloud. Um, and you're seeing a lot of lines and points and extracted features through this process. And this is really just a starting point to show, you know, when you collect that high quality data, it's that old garbage in garbage out adage. We have really high quality data at the foundation, that high resolution imagery, dense LiDAR point cloud, and it actually allows us to develop machine learning models that can start to extract a lot of this data at scale through an automated fashion. So that's something that's unique to, you know, Cyclomedia's kind of internal processes is we have that library built over time of all that great content. Um, we have these models that have been trained over the years to extract that data. Um, and ultimately, it's all a lot of fancy, cool looking technology, but the goal is to take the scale off your plate and deliver something uh, of value in a much quicker fashion than you know we've traditionally been able to do before. Um, an example we hear often from our county partners is that it, it may take them several years to complete an inventory of a single asset uh, across their jurisdiction. And oftentimes they say, you know, that's even too much to bear. We'll just focus on this area. Uh, and so through this approach, it actually allows us to tackle that problem. So this is a video that actually shows that process in, in real time. Um, I like to show this because it really helps us wrap our heads around um, how, how this all happens behind the scenes. And you actually see some of our internal software and process 
that once we capture that, that imagery in LIDAR, this is what we're doing to actually extract all of that data. Uh, so you'll see the high resolution imagery uh, actually so clear that you can even read ID tags on an asset. Um, and so I know the image in the center is, is very pretty, but I think on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and you'll see some call-outs here as, as this video moves along, uh, really important to consider. So this is actually us, again, building that database on the left-hand side, many assets that you know many, many folks in the county are responsible for managing. This is stuff that we are often extracting throughout an entire jurisdiction. So if you can think of that as that's the base of our asset extraction or data dictionary, on the right, we have configurable attributes. So what we mean by that is what, what attributes or related data for those assets do we need to collect in order for you to support your operations? So MUTCD kind signs, I'm sorry, MUTCD codes for signs, um, you know, facing direction, height, width, whatever we operate on a day-to-day -day base, let's make sure we collect that stuff at scale on the front end so that we have it moving forward. Um, and just here you're seeing that extracted data actually visualized in that, that visual environment with that high res imagery uh, where we can interact with that a little better. So just some highlights of the assets that we'll extract commonly. So all of that is, is a lot of interesting technology. I, I wanted to try to make things more visual for this afternoon. So it wasn't just reading a lot of PowerPoints, but I wanna kind of bring it back to the, the subject of the presentation, which is, you know, what does this mean for the end user? What does it mean when I get my hands on this data, you know, in terms of the use cases and workflows that open up for me uh, from a desktop? So at, at the core of that, at the base of, of what we do, the foundation, if you will, is what we call our geocycloramas. That's our panoramic imagery uh, with the LIDAR stitch behind that. But it's just important to differentiate why that resolution matters. It's, it's much different and much higher resolution than the standard you know, imagery that you might see from another source. Uh, 100 megapixel, 360 by 180, uh, parallax free. So on the right-hand side, you're seeing an example of image distortion and parallax, whereas you know, our process ensures that that does not happen as well as a rich QC process, quality control process on the back end. Um, Sub-inch accuracy is, is really important for a number of use cases. It's down to 0.4 inches when you're measuring heights, widths, lengths, um, four inches, 0.4 inches of accuracy. So that allows, you know, for example, assessors and appraisers across the country to actually assess properties from their desktop. Uh, it ensures that when you're taking measurements of particular assets that they're very accurate. Uh, and the high positional accuracy on average, it's, it's about four inches of where it actually is on earth and will project that on your local coordinate system. Uh, meaning the, the metadata will collect for all those assets, XYZ coordinates, timestamp, UID, that location of that asset where you show it on a base map or visualize it elsewhere uh, will be where it should be. So building on that imagery in, you know, from inspection of properties to inspection of assets is, is a really important one. Uh, we have a lot of teams that use this imagery on a regular basis to assess grade and condition of assets, um, read measurements and ID tags. And you know, from that point, yes, we can collect robust databases as a service, but it also allows you to actually develop and, and maintain those databases over time an environment like this, whether it's creating point locations, you know, line features and extracting that data almost yourself to pull into a GDB environment, um, that's all possible once you have access to that imagery and LIDAR. So here's another example of just what we can do with that imagery because of its accuracy uh, is actually interact with that imagery in, in this case in StreetSmart where you're seeing some of our measurements, uh, create point locations, linear features, simple to complex measurements, uh, on the screen, you're seeing an example of, of just measuring lane width, something you know fairly straightforward. Uh, bridge height clearance is something we'll see in transportation often, um, just making sure that that bridge is, is as high as it should be. Uh, and again, you can do this you know, all from your desktop through a SaaS environment on any common browser. Um, so this is a, a really cool one I mentioned earlier, street smart uh, elevation tool is, is what we call this thing, but you're seeing that LiDAR data being used to visualize roadway ponding. Um, so you can start to estimate or project the potential impact of flood events, uh, you know, get a, a database built of first floor flood elevations and actually identify properties that are at risk. So we work with a lot of uh, a lot of customers in coastal areas, uh, the Gulf, et cetera, where hurricanes are more prevalent. Well, they like to actually build a, a database and identify what properties are at risk uh, of these these kind of events or, or flooding and uh, actually ties back to some of the comments Carlos made uh, earlier this morning. 
So another use case here, and this is a much more kind of detailed look into, you know, what do we do when we get really into the weeds of extracting that attribution so that, you know, details related to the actual assets we extract and uh, ADA, ADA ramps and their dimensions and, and slopes and measurements are something that we'll get into on a common basis. So not just identifying the key points and attributes, but actually being able to recreate uh, the geometry of, of these ramps at scale. So we're actually able to automate a lot of this process, identify where all the ramps are, create this geometry. Uh, and from that point, actually extract a lot of other useful information. So whether it's you know algorithmically extracting measurements, uh, detailed attribution, what's the ramp type, location, intersection, uh, and compliance indicators is a big one. So we have a library of over 20 requirements where we can look at uh, all of these measurements or cross slope width, dome spacing, you know, is a signal present and how high, uh, and actually identify, you know, is this in or out of compliance with uh, the related requirement? Hello, five minute more notice. <laughs> Thank you. So getting to the end here, so this kind of wraps things up into, you know, what do we do with all of that information and how does it affect the environments we're used to, to working in? And, and here you see, you know, Web App Builder, and, and actually we have a, an interactive iframe of this. So it has both the imagery and this view I'm looking at here. If you go to our exhibitor page, you can actually explore some of this data yourself right on there. Uh, but this is um, what Steve mentioned at the beginning, the work we've been doing with Lariac to look at, you know, what assets can we extract through the county in combination with the imagery? What's that baseline of critical assets that will really improve our workflows, the data that we really need? Um, and be able to integrate the imagery in that asset with, with our day-to-day -day environments. So just to give you a sense of, of scale of, of how difficult this is to do uh, manually in just this, this is about 159 miles, there's around 90,000 assets um, of just the assets we chose to collect here, about 22 of them, and just 159 miles and 90,000 assets uh, that we identified and extracted here. So the idea of, of visiting all of those, doing that manually becomes pretty unwieldy. Uh, and you're seeing some on the left hand side, some of those common assets that we actually extracted for this project. So just another deeper insight into what the tabular data looks like. You're seeing the X, Y, Z coordinates, all the NETCD codes, both federal and California. Uh, and so again, once you have all that in here, now I can manage that database. I can view the granular data, uh, either build out or maintain that database from this kind of view. Um, and really just makes you know a big difference in terms of the approach to managing uh, my asset inventory or you know even even other use cases like optimizing you know field visits, knowing what's there and what equipment we might need to address a problem, um, improving response to three one one requests in terms of just accuracy and how quickly we can respond. <clears throat> Excuse me, um, more data to defend against you know potential legal disputes. Uh, and perhaps, you know, now more than ever, even having that complete inventory uh, allows us to support the concept of, of equity even, even more so by knowing where all those assets are and being able to maintain our infrastructure in an equitable fashion. Um, it really helps to, you know, really, really push that agenda forward as well. So I hope this gives a nice little overview of how all that data and imagery comes together. You can actually see the, the street smart image on the left hand side there and the points visualized. That little target cursor is showing that 3D layer behind the scenes. Uh, and again, all of this you can actually interact with on our exhibit page if you want to go explore some of that data. Uh, and the last point I'll leave us off with is just, just tying some hard numbers to some of that work. And I won't read through the bullets here, but uh, you're, you're welcome to really, this just captures the tip of the iceberg in my view of what that ROI looks like when we go and take imagery and, and LIDAR and automate some of these processes from a manual effort. This is just an apples to apples comparison of what we'll be spending manually, this is in Coral Gables, Florida, manually to go out and collect this data and address these assets versus being able to do it virtually at scale. This is the immediate um, nature of, of what we saved and what we're able to improve on, you know, seven weeks instead of two years of work. But what's not captured here, what's difficult to, you know, almost articulate is just that long-term operational benefit of owning that complete asset inventory of of knowing you know, how much funding do I need to maintain that? How many of these assets do I have across the county and, and what are they worth? Um, you know, what does that mean for the value of my jurisdiction? And what kind of funding levels do I need to maintain or improve on that in infrastructure moving forward? So all of that you know, in, in, uh, impacted for Coral Gables as they you know, are now able to work with this data. So that's 
the bulk of my content. Um, appreciate the time. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Steve, for uh, you know offering up the, the opportunity here. I do want to take a moment and just get some real-time feedback as we transition into Q&A. Uh, I'm going to bring back that Mentimeter tool here we saw in the morning uh, and just see if we can get some, some real-time feedback as we uh, jump into Q&A here, Steve. Okay, well, and uh, I'll start with a question while the Mentimeter is going. Um, and I, I didn't realize that your colleague was answering some of the questions before I caught them. So oh, um, we may have to re-raise them for the, for the full audience. But one that uh, was not in the question window is, can this technology be used in places that you can't drive, like on trails or other, in other places um, that are off-road? Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it's a case-to-case -case basis. We've uh, we've had solutions like a, a backpack lidar solution, for example. We can't necessarily bring the full camera unit out there, but we can take a similar approach to those areas. Uh, but it's not it's not a common thing we do. We've done them for a very niche projects, I would say. Okay, and then another question uh, that's come up: uh, Can you tell us a little bit about how this compares to what many are familiar with, Google Street View? Um, What's the difference is why would we maybe want to go this this direction with some a project? Yeah, absolutely. And it's a common question we get, and it really ties back to, I think, the entire narrative of the quality of that imagery, um, sub inch accuracy in terms of measurements, uh, the resolution of being able to inspect uh, quality grade condition. Um, you just can't interact with or, or rely on something like Google imagery um, for those particular business cases. Uh, it's also the same input, if you will, in terms of the imagery and the LIDAR data that allows us to do the asset extraction. So all of the use cases I covered today, you, you just, you really can't support them um, with alternative imagery that you'd find in, in something like a Google Street View. So again, if you're just trying to get in there, look at basic imagery and confirm that, you know, a building was there two years ago, right? Who, who knows how old the imagery is? Uh, maybe that's good enough. And in some cases, that's that's true. Uh, but for the use cases we looked at today, it's you just can't use it for that. Sure. Um, another question uh, from Matt in the Q&A. Uh, I wonder if this technology will eventually be able to pick up location of survey tags and benchmarks to match with the records. Um, so have you done anything or thought about anything in that realm? So to my knowledge, we haven't gone that granular for, for a lot of assets like street signs, utility poles, um, depending on where the tag is positioned, we can actually you know, extract a lot of that, right? Or manually, if, if the county is using the imagery, they can pull a lot of that information. Um, again, it's just what can we capture from the right of way? Cause that's you know, essentially legally where we can capture. And that, that's kind of our limitation when it comes to ID tags. Okay. Um, why don't we turn it back to your Mentimeter? We have about three minutes left and maybe you can address some of the things that are rolling by there. Yeah, yeah, I would love to actually get some dialogue um, with you, Steve. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of stuff come through here, you know, keep me from making unnecessary field visits. Uh, sign inspection, of course, is a big one. Uh, machine learning integration, well, there's a lot of input here. Curb dimension, sign inspection, vegetation, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, so, uh, for the, you know, to respond to a couple of those, I mean, certainly we have, you know, at least played with the idea and talked with you folks a little bit about, you know, doing vegetation analysis. And and I know there's some proof of concept you've been working on with that to do tree tree measurements and things of that nature, um, oh, which yeah. is really exciting if you want to talk about maybe some of that. Absolutely. So vegetation management is actually a very well-established use case for us. Uh, we do that work at, at a very large scale for the largest um, utility on the West Coast. And, you know, again, that vegetation management is, it's not a proof of concept for us. We're actually able to inventory all of the utility poles, their attachments, power lines, uh, and, and identify how close vegetation is to all those power lines for fire risk. I mean, down, down to inches, right? So we'll actually identify, here's the things that are most at, most at risk within four feet, eight feet, et cetera, uh, and build an entire inventory of that so they can actually prioritize that, that vegetation management work for, you know, even fire risk too. Great. Um, another one I see popping up there that um, I don't know if we've talked about, but it certainly is important to us in LA County is homeless encampments. So the idea, you know, we certainly you know from the street, we can see quite a bit of, you know, of that um, and maybe somewhat off the roads. Um, any, yeah. any potential you see there to, to quantify or track um, that kind of, of uh, at, I guess you'd call it an asset, tents and yeah. other, other encampment features. 
Yeah, I mean, when, when we talk about, you know, I think really the use case there is understanding uh, change detection might be the broader use case, right? You know, where where are those groups moving? Are they expanding? Um, and I've seen it firsthand, you know, being a Southern California resident. Um, we actually are, are forward looking into the ability to actually do more frequent captures at a lower cost. That's the kind of use case that would fall under of being able to get a regular update from an imagery perspective on you know really phenomenon like that is it growing where are they located and how do how do we track and understand um you know that phenomenon and, and help manage it well very good we are at the end of our time so again i would like to thank connor and uh his uh, invisible colleague <laughs> uh, brock for helping to answer Thanks, some of the questions um so thank you Thanks, both guys. and